Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this EduServe web webinar. We're going to get started because uh, we haven't got a great deal of time. We've got quite a lot to get through. Um, my name is Andy Powell. I'm CTO at EduServe. We're really pleased so many of you could uh, join us today. We had over 50 people registered. Not quite sure how many have actually joined the call, so uh, the webinar so far, but um, really good to see so many of you here. Um, for, for those of you that don't know us, EduServe is a not-for-profit uh, based in Bristol. We actually have three parts to our business, but the, uh, the pertinent part today is EduServe Cloud Solutions. Um, we exist to help our customers exploit technology and in particular to exploit public cloud and Clearly, sort of smart city activity, use of data and so on forms a key part of uh, one of the things people are turning to public cloud vendors like Microsoft, Amazon Web Services and so on um, to uh, help them with. So uh, very much on target for us today. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, uh, we will take questions. We're going to do that at the end of um, Apollo's talk. Um, I'll introduce Apollo in a moment. Um, so uh, use the uh, question tab in the GoToWebinar interface if you want to ask a question. We'll we'll run through those at the end. Um, the other thing is, um, if you have any problems with sound quality or uh, any other issues during the webinar, uh, feel free to press the hand button. So raise your hand, and, and we'll get flagged of that, and we can. Um, take some action. So let's get started. Um, I wanted to start by uh, just talking about smart cities a little bit. And I, I've done what everyone does, I suppose, when they're thinking about smart cities, and that's turn to Wikipedia and see what um, Wikipedia has to say. So they define, I've slightly modified this, um, uh, but broadly speaking, they define a smart city. Uh, or we actually prefer the term smart place, I must say, but smart city is an urban area that uses data to manage assets and resources efficiently and to help citizens go about their business more effectively. Um, so this includes data collected from citizens, from devices, um, and it includes assets that are processed and analyzed, monitored to manage traffic and transportation systems, uh, power plants, water supply, waste management, law enforcement, information systems, schools, libraries, hosp hospitals, fire services uh, pertinent to today, um, and basically any other community services. So that's really how we think of the smart cities um, space. I think the important thing there is the critical role of data in smart cities. And clearly, data plays a fundamental role in our ability to deliver smart services. So you can't really do smart, smarter services without building on a coherent and well-managed data resource. And so in any smart city or smart place activity, you're really relying on the collection and management of data, coupled with the ability to learn from that data, to draw inferences from it in order to make better decisions. And, and that really brings me to uh, the meat of today's session, how London Fire are using data to be smarter. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Apollo Gerolimbus, um, who is head of data analytics at London Fire Brigade. And uh, Apollo is going to speak to us about the ways in which London Fire are attempting to exploit data to improve the services that they deliver. So with that, I'll hand over to Apollo. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd just like to start off uh, with a brief, brief background about uh, London Fire Brigade and, and the role that the kind of data analytics team play in it. As Andy mentioned, uh, any questions, happy to take them at the end. Otherwise, you feel free to, to get in touch with me. My details are up and I'll put them up again at the end. So uh, London is a, uh, obviously a very large place. Um, the area it covers is uh, around about, sorry, <coughs> around about 1,500 square kilometers uh, and around about eight, almost nine million people. Uh, three and a half million homes, almost a million businesses uh, spread over 32 boroughs plus the city of London. Uh, and we cover this area with a uh, resource pool of about 102 fire stations, uh, 142 frontline fire engines, uh, engines 
uh, and around 5,000 operational staff um, and around 800 office staff. And broadly speaking, we go to around 100, 110,000 incidents a year. Now these incidents, are sort of again, a ballpark breakdown of these incidents is that around half of them are false alarms, but we don't spend that much time at each of these false alarms. 30% uh, or 30,000 incidents are special services, so things we attend like floodings, road traffic collisions, uh, animal rescues, and so on. Uh, and the remaining 20,000 incidents, broadly speaking, are fires. And of those, around 5,000 of those are, are the most serious incidents we attend, which are, of course, fires in dwellings, uh, fires where people live and sleep. We, we kind of offer up uh, home fire safety visits. We do almost 90,000 home fire safety visits a year. About 80% of those are targeted at what we call a priority dwelling, priority one dwelling. Uh, and we also do lots of regulatory inspections in businesses and places where people uh, work. So. London Fire Brigade have essentially have come a long way uh, in their history. Uh, gone are the days when we've, we've been seen kind of moving around on, on horses and carts or pinning bits of information to cork boards in the control center. Uh, we now have very modern fire appliances. This is our Series 3 Mercedes up on the screen and also quite complicated integrated systems that collect uh, a lot of data. And that, of course, leaves a lot of data to be analyzed which brings me kind of to the, the key topic of today's webinar is what, what about analytics uh, in, in London Fire Brigade? You know, are we still using old methods or, or are we kind of a, a modern service ourselves? So brief overview of the team. We are an interdisciplinary team. Uh, we've got 12 people, uh, a, a mix of skills, which I'll cover in a bit. And, and we work with pretty much all the stakeholders internally and externally who, who have an interest in, in fire service and the fire service operations. That includes fire investigation, our community safety teams, the operational tactics departments, special operations group that look at things like counter-terrorism, uh, local authorities, so external stakeholders, also the borough commanders and station managers who are our frontline kind of uh, management team, uh, our communications and press team, and all the kind of freedom of information requests that come through uh, essentially get processed by our department. And also we work with the 999 uh, center, the mobilizing center. And that's probably where we'll focus most of our webinar on today is around the use of, of data to improve, improve attendance times uh, and data that looks at kind of uh, traffic and GPS mobilizations. So as I mentioned, we provide business intelligence to the organization. We, we do all their day-to-day -day analytics. We look at incident, incidents and the demand of incidents. Uh, we have a, a sort of spatial mapping function within the department where we can uh, display kind of uh, the spatial analysis of our kind of demographic uh, analysis. Um, and we also look at kind of hot topics that come up like electronic cigarettes and uh, driverless cars and whatever it might be that's the sort of flavor of the month in terms of uh, you know analysis. Uh, just moving on, um, an example of some of the tools we use and some of the types of analysis as I mentioned we, we rely quite heavily on, on mapping and spatial analytics simply because displaying some of these large data sets in a visual way to an operational borough commander let's say in Islington or Richmond it's really helpful for them to see things on a map, especially if we're looking at patterns in deliberate fires or, or any such you know, risk profiles of, of local residents by postcode or something like that. Um, and we, we, we use the traditional tools. We're, we're quite Microsoft heavy in, in those, but we also have opened up recently to some of the more open source tools like QGIS, uh, Python, and R programming to do some of our analysis. Uh, I mentioned GPS mobilizations. We've developed some internal dashboards where uh, managers can look at the routes that the fire appliances took to a particular incident and analyze those routes, looking at how much time a fire appliance spent on each road, for example. They might want to analyze the impact of a local road closure, perhaps, or the impact of um, 
some street festival, bridge closure, whatever it might be, uh, this, allow, this will allow them to do that. Uh, and essentially all the data is kind of ingested overnight uh, and pre-populated, uh, snapped to the road network and served up in the form of a, a relatively easy to use uh, front end dashboard for managers. At this point, it's probably worth mentioning a really interesting project that happened recently. Uh, the EENA, which is the European Emergency Number Association, did a project in partnership with Waze, uh, which is a sort of community let's say crowdfunded um, platform that integrates uh, live data onto a map and displays traffic data. Uh, and essentially they, they um, trialed whether Waze would be able to integrate with emergency services in three areas. One being around more intelligent routing and avoiding traffic uh, to improve attendance times. Uh, another would be whether users of Waze could use the platform to report incidents effectively to the emergency services. Uh, and the final one would be kind of a data quality assurance, essentially, against the calls that they're receiving through the traditional methods to kind of verify uh, the location or, in fact, the significance of an incident. Using the, the appliance availability information and the resource status change messages that come out of our mobilizing system, we're able to answer the question we get asked quite a lot, which is, how busy are you? Uh, at a very accurate uh, time frame. So essentially, traditionally, we would say X percent of the time we are busy, X percent of the time we are not responding to emergencies and so on. Uh, and now using the status change information, which is essentially big data because it produces tables with hundreds and hundreds of million rows of data, uh, essentially at any minute of the day, we're able to say exactly how many fire appliances were uh, available, occupied at an emergency incident or unavailable for any reason. And this is an example on screen that you have now from the recent uh, Wanstead Flats uh, grass fire, which was a 40 pump grass fire in, uh, in London. And you can see the development of that incident when we reached peak activity for that incident, keeping in mind we were attending other things at the same time, and then how long it took to return to a sort of normal, let's say, baseline level of, of utilization where where we're doing our business as usual, et cetera, and there's no sort of large incident ongoing. And these tools kind of uh, do a lot in the background. There's a lot of data processing, a lot of uh, information kind of uh, quality checks and stuff that we've automated that happens uh, in this case overnight. And then in the morning, essentially, managers are able to open up these tools in a, in a central portal uh, and essentially just ask the questions that they, they need answered and get, get responses quite quickly. To give some context, this used to take probably about half an hour to do in Excel. Uh, and like I say, now it's, it's something that you can very simply just pick a day or a month and the data gets displayed for you. The final point I want to make around uh, emergency mobilizations. And while I talk about it, I'm just going to try and play a video for you. And this is some work we've been doing with uh, uh, essentially the external consultants called ORH based in Reading. And the work that we that I'm showing you now is work that essentially enables our control officers to make uh, more data driven decisions, better informed decisions around how to move fire engines across London to cover areas when there is a significant incident going on or a series of smaller incidents that mean a certain area of London is uh, doesn't have the cover that it would usually have. So what you're seeing on this map is essentially uh, the 5th of November, which is traditionally quite a busy day for us. We're about just after 10 in the morning now. And you can see as the fire engines, which are the, the small gray dots moving around London and areas of cover, which is displayed on the red to blue scale, are essentially becoming better or worse. Uh, control officers have these tools available to them to make decisions around, should I move a fire engine from this area to another area to improve the predicted attendance time? Um, or, or in fact, if they know the incidents that are going on are, are not that significant, as I mentioned earlier, false alarms, for example, don't last very long, uh, then they might make the decision not to. But if a large incident occurs uh, and that area of London 
has a lot of occupied fire engines in it, then they might choose to move a fire engine from a different area in London over to that area as a standby. And what that would essentially mean is the, the mean response time would decrease, which is a good thing. Uh, and we've done a few projects with uh, external organizations like uh, UCL. Uh, we had a master's student from their space time lab of data analytics who did a, his whole master's project on precisely this, uh, comparing the predicted attendance times to the actual attendance times we were achieving and using the data around the street speeds, the actual speeds fire engines can achieve on, on different categories of roads and looking at the route choices that drivers were making, essentially built a model to say, if we were to have a live, uh, a live quotient of, let's say, the speed of every single road in London, based on what fire engines can achieve on that road historically, then essentially the attendance time would, would decrease. Um, another change we've made recently is we mobilized fire engines based on their geographic location not their station ground or patch as it's called. Uh, and what that means is that it kind of works like Uber. The closest fire engine to you that is available will be the one mobilized to you. And that is, when I say closest, I mean in terms of the time it will take to arrive. And that takes into account the speed of the roads that it will have to travel down. So if there are two fire engines equidistant essentially to your incident, the one with the faster roads between it and the incident will be the one uh, to attend. And that in itself has created quite uh, significant decreases in our, in our attendance times. Um, but as you can see now on the map, we're around getting approaching half past 8 p.m. Uh, there's quite a lot of incidents going on. It's bonfire night. Uh, you are seeing uh, an, in the north of London, let's say just then, uh, a large incident developing. And pumps from areas that are not um, that busy could be sent into areas that are busy in order to reduce that kind of uh, that average response time. Sort of wrapping up here, I mean, we have a lot of data. We collect a lot of data about a lot of different things. We collect data around the incidents we attend, about London and Londoners, uh, daytime population, estimates for different areas of the city. We collect information about our, um, of course, the properties and types of property that, that, that uh, London is made up of. Uh, and we've done quite a lot of work recently moving into the sort of data science space, trying to make better use of uh, free text information that we gather uh, using sort of natural language processing, um, but also trying to understand the built environment, be that trying to identify high-rise buildings or trying to identify uh, domestic premises that we believe are at a greater risk of fire. Because ultimately what we're trying to achieve here is reduce the number of fires and when they do occur, uh, attend as quickly as possible. And that leaves me with the final slide essentially, which kind of wraps up um, my side of, of the webinar, which is, if you have any questions. Can I speak? Yep. Yes. Um, great. Thanks very much, Apollo. That was really interesting. And I appreciate within, you know, a sort of 30 minute slot like this is, it's difficult. There's an awful lot of material there you, you could be covering. Um, while we wait and see if any questions come in from um, listeners out there, uh, I'd like to ask you a, a quick question, which is really I what I call an interview question, really. It's around what your biggest challenges were in moving to much greater use of data. So was it with the technology? Was it around funding? Was it getting buy-in from senior management? Was it quality of data kinds of issues? Was it something else? I'm just interested in, in what you found hardest and maybe what you would have done differently knowing what you know now. Sure. So when I first started here, the the, the team was uh, three or four people and it was very traditional kind of reporting on data that we had, you know, using reporting services, Microsoft reporting services um, and moving away from that kind of just producing performance statistics into trying to do something a little bit more insightful, more fun, 
you know, something uh, using the data better. I think the first hurdle was skills, right? So yeah. um, learning the spatial analytics tools, Python, R programming language, uh, some of the dash interactive dashboards, it, it's a skills gap. And luckily we were building the team anyway. And the people who, who were here had, had an appetite to learn about these new methods, let's say, new skills. Uh, and so that, that was the first, uh, the first hurdle was, was kind of getting, getting the training, uh, getting the tools, because obviously some of these open source tools uh, were not installed previously. And in order to get open source tools installed on kind of, you know, government machines, you need to go through a few, a few hurdles there. But, you know, we've, we're in a very good place now where we have, like I say, a team of 12, uh, a mix of skills. Uh, some people are better at the programming, others are better at, uh, you know, the mapping or going to a meeting and talking to stakeholders. Uh, and also we've ha we have access to sort of virtual machines where we can do whatever we want, uh, install whatever tools we need. Uh, and so we're in a much better place. But I think, yeah, access to the tools uh, and skills, I mean, kind of speaks itself. But th those were the two, the two main things. The data was actually really good. So we have a lot of... Um, a lot of data quality checks that have been uh, historically happen after every incident. Um, and in terms of the mobilization, you know, data, the GPS data, those have been quite good. I mean, obviously you still need to do some data cleaning uh, in any exercise, but, but the biggest hurdle wasn't actually the data. It, it was probably getting, getting, getting the people trained up to, to use the tools you know that we're now using um but like i said the, the 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 appetite was there so it didn't take a lot of convincing it just took some training sessions and some planning etc cool okay thanks my, my second question is uh, is around uh, geography i suppose um and not so much just geography within london but it seems to me any smart city uh, slash data based exercise inevitably you have a geographic boundary between the things you're responsible for and the things that are going on around that space uh, but i assume in practice if there's a big fire just outside your geographic boundaries you may well get pulled in and and join forces with another fire service is that true so i suppose my question is if, if that is the case what have there been have you have you made any progress in sort of sharing standards with other fire services i suppose yeah so we we do uh, go across the border and uh, cross border brigades do come into london uh, obviously we have we have to adhere to our our specific what we call safe systems of work and policies and procedures are, uh, around let's say firefighting in a in a in a built environment or a, a compartment firefighting uh, so, so we we would treat it as if we were attending on our own, but they would also join forces. That's absolutely true. We share a lot of data with neighbouring brigades, um, and that could be data from the NHS around kind of the uh, location of vulnerable people, or it could be information around premises that we know have domestic oxygen cylinders, which is obviously a risk to firefighters, or premises that have uh, you know sort of car workshops and, and risks that that are present inside buildings that we might end up attending. So we do share a lot of data. Uh, and also in terms of planning London fire cover, we take into account that some of the neighboring, the closest fire stations on our border are retained fire stations. So they might take a little bit longer to be activated and attend an incident. Uh, and we, but we obviously know which, which those are. Um, and our mobilizing systems take that into account when sending a fire engine to an incident. So, yeah, we, we work well together. Um, there are obviously more opportunities n now and in the future uh, to share, share data and get, get more insights around kind of the, the vehicle deployments or, or the road speeds, etc. And that really is an area that, that is, is growing and, and we, we will be looking into. Uh, it's worth noting that we have a project called the Zero Emissions Pumping Appliance Project. Essentially, it's a, like a clean slate of design a new fire engine with zero emissions. And you can have any kind of telemetry or, or anything you want 
on there. Uh, and that project is kind of starting now, but it's going to be a really good opportunity for us to get data about things like when did the water first start pumping? What was the flow rate of the pump? Uh, you know, the precise location, I suppose, in, in, in the center of London using 5G technology and things that I don't really know that much about, but there, there'll definitely be opportunities to to take this one step further using those technologies. Okay, cool. So there's a quick uh, question coming from Chris Fry. How much of a strategic commitment of London Fire Brigade made to data collection and data quality? Okay, so as part of our uh, integrated risk management plan, which is the kind of what the government sets out every fire service uh, has to have, um, we need to have a clear understanding of all the foreseeable uh, risks within our, our area. So firefighters go out and do lots of safety inspections. They do lots of home fire safety messaging and community safety work. We visit schools. We collect essentially as many data sets as possible that, that are available or people want to share with us. Some of those are open data, things like, you know, even from the census around locations of people uh, who don't have central heating, who might be at more risk, let's say, of um, using an unsafe means of warming their home, right through to data sets around, you know, like heritage buildings, essentially whatever it is uh, we've sort of taken into account we've delivered some tools to the public uh, where they can put their postcode in and see exactly uh, what their local ward area or borough area looks like in terms of the risks that they've told us that they're worried about right so we're not just assuming what people are worried about we've gone out and asked what what people are worried about uh, and all those data sets have been uh, built in i assume we can share some links when we make this webinar available afterwards yes. i'm happy to, to share those um and so yeah the, the, there's there's a growing department uh data quality is obviously very important we also go out and engage with the crew managers station managers borough commanders or the operational side the people that are actually entering the data following an incident we show them tools that we've created using data that they've entered to try and kind of increase their understanding of what we're doing with the data but also reduce any resistance that they might have to filling in a form or filling in some data uh, collection template that we've supplied and i think that's a really important point is you know if you want your end users to uh, t take ownership of data quality as well uh, then you need to share the, the end results of what you're doing with their with their entry back to them so that's kind of the key point of us delivering this central portal on our intranet where people can go and it will you know active via active directory will recognize who they are uh, and essentially serve up data that is relevant to their role and things that they should know about or should care about to do their job yeah cool right we've got about a minute left so you have to make this quite quick um okay. question coming from alessandro chester uh you mentioned moving from traditional reporting what for you is the main difference between performance reporting and insight reporting? I think you need to give people at the end of them looking at the report, they need to go away feeling that they've taken something useful to go and do their job. So a traditional report might list a series of fire hydrants that need service uh, that essentially a more, a more insightful report should uh, leave the user with an, the impression that they've they've got something useful that they can go away and, and do their job more effectively with that piece of information, be it uh, serving up a, an insight that is using two combined data sources that they may not have seen before, or pr some sort of prioritization, or some something that is more useful than just looking at a list or a, a table. That's Cool. Shall I ask that one last question? Okay, sorry, we got one last in from Cynthia yeah. Darby's. Uh, does London Fire plan to make use of drones in the next two to three years for traffic management, crowd management, and or fire monitoring? Yeah, so actually uh, drone trial started two weeks ago, the first uh, drone trial. Uh, I, I happened to see the first operational deployment of the drone and the pictures and video that it that it took uh, is extremely useful for monitoring uh, fires from above uh, and also 
you know, giving an op operational oversight where there might not be a line of sight view to whatever risk they're targeting. So yes, there is a drone trial ongoing currently, uh, and and I'll, I'll wait and see the feedback, but I'm sure it's going to be positive because even after just one or two operational deployments, people are singing its praises. Yeah, cool. And presumably it's going to be a yet another source of data for you. Okay, I think we'll wind up at that point. I just want to say a massive thank you to Apollo. Really interesting webinar. I hope you all found it interesting. And, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Over and out.